Hello. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I, I just lost the screen, so that's not nice when we're just starting. <laughs> okay, here I am. So good evening, everybody. We're joining tonight for a talk about uh, how the tech industry has been disturbing all the industries and particularly the sports industry. So when I say we, it's Digital Arabia Network with our panelists. And uh, for those who don't know what Digital Arabia Network is, we're a group of people who believe that technology can change our lives for the better. Although sometimes some people question that. <laughs> and we have joined effort into shaping the future of the MENA region. So we follow a holistic approach towards digital transformation. And we work across five sp spheres, arts and culture, business and the future of work, civic participation, gender equality and inclusion, and definitely online media and journalism. So tonight we're gonna talk about how the, the, the technology is unlocking, unlocking uh, unprecedented opportunities for growth in the sports industry. So we all know that uh, technology is affecting all industries. We will learn more how this is affecting the sports industry tonight. Uh, I will briefly introduce our panelists because I don't want to make it long and we have to like start the discussion lively. So first we have Munir Zok, who has like 15 years of experience in the sports industry. He has recent, previously worked and lived in the United States in the Olympic and Paralympic Committee. He is the CEO of Next Sports now based in uh, Barcelona. Uh, that is a consulting firm specialized in innovation, uh, data and digital technology and investment strategy. We also have with us Timothy Johnston. He's the product owner in Dimension Data. He's with us from South Africa. So Timothy has led the implementation and support team for a selection of the Armory Sports Organization's uh, cycling events. This includes the management and development of the solution. And in a nutshell, he will tell us how they moved the Tour de France, the Tour de France to, to, to a more digital age. And we also have with us uh, Kamel. Uh, Kamel has worked, uh, has studied in Concordia, Montreal and Kamel Samakiye, sorry. <laughs> and he's originally from Lebanon. He was also the partner, co-founder of a company called Codefish. It's a software development agency. And then one of the projects of Codefish was actually into that he is currently the CEO and managing partner. So into is a sports and fitness cloud uh, CRM and the booking platform that mainly works in the MENA region, but looking to uh, expand abroad. So hello to everybody. I hope you're all unmuted, like Kamel, Timothy, and Munir. Hi, Eva. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. Hi. You're welcome. Hi. I'm happy to have you. <laughs> really big pleasure to be okay. here. Thank you. So. We'll start with what did technology do to the sports industry? We know that it affects many services in this industry, like the events part of it or the organizers. And it also affects how the fans are, uh, you know, reacting to, to certain events or even to certain uh, in the. Uh, activities like football or maybe others, but it also have affected the athletes. It also have affected the users. 
So first and foremost, I need to ask Timothy, how did technology somehow uh, not change the Tour de France, but uh, influence it? Uh, what has been used as, as technologies, you know, to, to broaden the content reach? Because no, we know that uh, cycling had an audience and usually it's mainly like live audience or even broadcasted, the ones who follow the broadcasted uh, events. But putting the Tour de France on digital platforms have surely changed the the content reach of this major cycling event worldwide. So can you tell us more? How did you go by doing this? What technologies have been used? What platforms? Sure. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks for having me for two, uh, on the, uh, with you tonight. Um, the, the, there are two points of inflection with the, with the journey that we've gone on with the Emory Sports Organization and the Tour de France. Um, the first point was in, if I cast, if I take you back to 2014, um, the, the way that the data was taken uh, and provided to the fans of uh, the gaps between the groups in the, in the race, uh, the time of the leading rider and so on. Uh, there's a lady called Claire who had a, a blackboard and she would sit on the back of the motorbike in front of the leading rider. And on the race radio, she would get, uh, she would get the, the times sort of given to her over radio and she would write them down and then she would show them. And the way that that would get onto the TV is the camera would zoom in on that. And that would be then, and then sort of that was kind of, that's, that was 2014, so not that long ago. Uh, and then in 2015, in, uh, then Dimension Data, now NTT, um, joined the ASO uh, and said, listen, we, we'd like to bring a digital experience into, into, into the Tour de France, get that information that we know we can get given the technologies that are available um, and then and, and enrich the fan experience. That was the key driver that they were looking at because broadcast can get you so far. And then it was that next level that, that um, NTT, we thought we could bring to the, to the experience. So what we did is we took a GPS transponder, basically something that's similar to the thing that sits in your phone and find, you know, helps you with Google Maps. And each cyclist has that under their seat uh, on the, during the Tour de France. And what that does is it broadcasts that signal. And I'll show you a picture now just to show you. It, I just want to compare, contrast the two pictures of Claire with a blackboard on the back of a motorbike to what we have today. Um, and that data it transmitted through various networks and ultimately through down to the big data truck that sits at the end of the race, which then gets delivered to my team. And what we do then is we take that GPS information and we analyze it as much as we can. We get speed, we get um, the great, we know the gradient of the road that they're going to travel on. We can, uh, we give, we use that to determine their braking power and, and so on, and then apply a whole lot of machine learning models to that data. We determine if there's, you know, by looking at the movement within the cyclist, we can tell that something is about to happen, whether it's a break, whether it's a, you know, whether they're just repositioning themselves for, for a particular thrust up the mountain or, or something like that. There's, we can do that, we can um, predict if based on who's in the in a break, if a break has happened, we can predict if that break is going to be caught. We also use some of the static data before the race to identify uh, who the stage favorites are. And we pit ourselves against the, the journalists and, and the commentators and see who's, you know, at the end of the race, a little bit of bragging rights to see who got it right that stage. So there's quite a lot of, you know, going from clear in the blackboard to where we are now and the sort of the in-depth analysis that we can provide, uh, it's, it's quite a thing. Uh, like looking at this year's Tour de France when we had the time trial and it was a very sort of uh, high intensity time trial because the leader was one minute ahead and you know, whoever won the time trial and by how much would win the race. 
So it was quite, and we were able to give that information to the fan so that they could see, you could see on the TV, you could see the difference and the growing gap and, you know, increase that experience on broadcast based on the data that comes from the, from the screen, from the, from the GPS trackers. So I'm just going to share. Can you see that? Yes. Can you see that? So I just picture your picture clear with it, with a blackboard on the back of a motorbike. Now what we've got is we've got the cyclists, the signal gets transmitted via a mesh network through to the closest signal, so to the closest receiver. So into the motorbike, we've into the helicopter and into the airplane up above. That comes down into the big data truck and then we distribute it all over the place. We distribute it into the data analytics that we use with the machine learning onto the race center site. Social media, we add it to the live stream, streaming. We augmented the TV experience. There's a client experience center that we have as well. And we provide that information to the commentators. So okay. it's just, uh, just like to, it, you know, we talk about the content reach and going from that GPS signal and that information from the bicycle, it gets grow, it's sort of blown up into all those using some, some really clever analytics and some really clever machine learning models. That's great. I don't think people can really relate to what the Tour de France was because actually geographically it was a huge. I've always thought like, how can they manage, you know, sharing the data when they are miles and miles away from each other's before technology. Now that we have all this, you wonder how they used to do it before. Yeah. But my question is, is this data shared only on the platforms or is there a way to share it with the cyclists as well and with the athletes? Do they benefit from data about like other pelotons or this is forbidden about their own? So how is this not from the fan side, from, but from the user side for the athletes? So the athletes have, there's a lot of, um, so all this data is that the, the data that we collect is available to the athletes uh, and, and they can use it as they see fit. Cycling is, is slightly different from some of the other sports. I think if you go into, <clears throat> excuse me, if you go into Formula One, a lot of that, uh, those metrics are, are, are more readily available. Well, I'm not too sure about Formula One. There's some portions of that that is quite secretive. But cycling as well, they don't share the, um, the biometric data of the cyclists. Mm. So we get a lot of the, you know, the uh, geographic data. So we can tell how fast they're going. And that's why there needs to be a lot of um, uh, sort of analysis and extraction from that data to interpret what it means. They, I think if you, if you look at, um, if say for the heart rate, so something as simple as the heart rate without going into anything deeper, but the heart rate between two competing cyclists, if that was ready, readily available, then the sports director from one team could say, oh, he's, his heart rate is through the roof. He's battling. He's going to, you know, he's going to choke on the next mm. climb. Let's push him. And then, so, okay. you know, giving that. Yes, it won't, it won't be ethical somehow, but within the same team, they can, they can use the data. Yes. So there's this data that's available to the teams as well. That, that I think if you, if you think about the team on the Tour de France, the sports mm. director is driving in a car. And he's mm. got the best signal he's got is his phone signal. And that's, mm. you know, and so he doesn't necessarily know how well his cyclist at the front of the race is doing, but using our edge, edge system that we've got. Okay. Got a visitor. Just using okay. the, the system that we've got that gets fed to them. So it doesn't have to go all the way around and back to them. It goes from those, from the GPS trackers and it gets straight put into Directly to them. them. To them, yes. So that level of data is available to them, not necessarily the biometric data. Jumping okay. in, um, Eva, j just to yes. comment what, what Timothy um, is talking about. You know, in, in cycling, um, you know, depending on, on which uh, cycling race or which cycling competition we were talking about, there are very specific regulations around the uh, data communication uh, to the cyclists. Yes. Yeah? So you have one one way data communication, which is sort of 
sending data from a bicycle or from a heart rate monitor to mm -hmm. a cloud to an analytics platform to the coach. And then you have the two-way communication system, which is communication between coach or sporting director and cyclists. Most of the times, this is not allowed because it does yes. create a competitive imbalance, like mm -hmm. the, the situation that Timothy uh, was, was mentioning. In other yes. sports, however, like um, very recently, uh, we saw uh, at, in MotoGP, right, which is a, a mm -hmm. motorcycling race that happens on a circuit, um, you know, on TV, we could see the heart rate, uh, not only of the pilots that were riding the bike, okay. but also of the commentators, you know, who are commentating <laughs> the specific... Uh, That's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so, Sometimes yeah. the commentators are more excited than the the, the, the athlete, actually. Listen, I, I, lived, I lived in Italy for a long time. In Italy, uh, MotoGP is a very, very, very... Yes, famous. Yes. You know, like that, there, there's, there's this rider, I mean, pilot, who still, who still competes, not at the, the heights of, of his peak. His name is Valentino Rossi. And mm. the commentator is so famous for just being so much into the the race like he would have his heartbeats i'm sure going up through the roof whereas the pilot would have been doing so so yeah, but i think yes. technology is just bringing us as fans and as viewers and followers of the sport mm. to a much closer uh that dimension to the athletes and to the people who are actually bringing the sports to to us Yes, this takes us a little bit about, you know, discussing how this has driven the, the fan experience. You said that it surely has brought the fans closer to the event, but this is like the, the upside. I need to ask you a little bit what I see is a bit of a downside, knowing that young people and users are more into, you know, bite-sized information, so they go on IGTV, they go on, you know, maybe Facebook or other platforms and they just watch sequences. They just want to know the result. They, hasn't this affected actually the, the industry? Like I remember staying hours watching a Formula One race. I don't do this anymore. And it's, it's a pity, but uh, the broadcasters as well are less, let's say, uh, creative in the way they broadcast sports because they feel like they've lost a part of, you know, their, their uh, what used to be their uh, exclusivity. So I don't know, Munir, if you can tell us from a business side how this technology, te technical evolution have changed the, the fan experience, not only with more reach, but also with a different type of content. TVs don't always buy the same rights for football and so on, because there are also online hacked, you know, TV stations. That's another issue we're not discussing now. But this bite-sized information, you know, like just seeing a resume and going through the small info instead of really going through the experience. It's uh, what you talk about, Eva, is a very serious threat to the uh, entertainment industry in, in general. You know, I think mm. that the same claims that you make can be extended to the music industry, you know, to the fashion. Yes, as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, today we have in sports a very big challenge ahead of us to determine how do we attract the interest and the, and the attention of uh, Generation Z, right? Mm -hmm. We thought that the generation of millennials was the one that came with the biggest challenges, only now to discover that those challenges are, are minor mm. with respect to the challenges that we're currently facing with Generation Z. Um, everything that you mentioned is spot on, you know, uh, uh, what is called snackable content or like bite-sized content is, is content that is extremely popular to the point where the NBA was the first sports property to actually launch a snackable content offering uh, for, uh, for, for uh, under a payment uh, services. Mm. And they had massive success with that. Mm. You know, uh, consumer trends evolve in time. Uh, we could argue that uh, the whole world started changing much quicker 
than um, anyone had anticipated uh, since 2008 when the first iPhone made it to the market, you know, with the iPhone coming in and the smartphone as we understand it today, all of the yes. technology components within it uh, became democratic and available for, 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 for anyone, which then gave birth to all of the startups that we, yes. see, that we see today. But it also gave birth to this new consumer behavior that we yes. could not have anticipated, you know? Um, all of a sudden, in, the po in our pocket, we have the whole world. However, we still have only 24 hours in a day. And however, we, can, we need sort of eight to, like six to eight hours to sleep. So that leaves 16 hours of available time for any property or any business to capture mm. our attention and capture our, our economy. Uh, yep. In 2008, there was no uh, social media. You know? It was a concept, it wasn't a reality. Sure. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you, you would be glued to your TV watching a Formula One race. Yes, because we had no other options. You know, there was no Netflix, there was no Hulu, there was no Amazon. Uh, mobile gaming was not a thing. Um, you know? So all of the offering that we have today is competing for that same 16 hour time frame. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. You know? And in the past, true. we had a very big chunk available uh, for it uh, true. in the sports industry. Today, we're, 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 we're fighting, you know, and the properties that have invested and bedded um, since early on on what we can call sort of their digital transformation journey or their digital transformation uh, in general are the ones who are today benefiting massively of course. from all of the following. Yes that they are obtaining, but also from all of the conversion that they yes. are able to, to do and then, you know, increase their, their market share. Yes. And Timothy, this probably has driven sponsors to ask for more data to be used as maybe, you know, we, we know a lot about the push notifications and how they stimulate, they, a, a sponsor can use this data to stimulate the user by receiving, you know, a kind of, how is this somehow being used, not only for the Tour de France, but through this industry, like knowing that they want more bite-sized information, is this being uh, made available for, for like, like the example done in NBA, for example, for snackable info? Is this applicable also at the Tour de France or is the Tour de France still known like the one month event that you follow day and night? You know, this is very challenging for a classical format like the Tour de France. Absolutely. And I think, I think I'd like to spin it slightly differently because I think I think the the entire world has got into these bite-sized chunks, you know, everything. So it's not just mm -hmm. sports entertainment. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's your entire life is very in, in bite-sized chunks. That's why Twitter is popular because then we don't have to read a whole article. We just read the headlines, yes. form a very strong opinion on very little and then off you go. But unfortunately, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. For good or bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, but the, so I think, I think the sports industry has had to develop this, this, this greater technology um, capability because so as to compete for that same 16 hours that Munir is talking about. So that, you know, sport uh, was always a weekend game. It was always a weekend entertainment and that was the thing. And then if you look at, if you look at uh, football matches now, um, I, I don't know the La Liga sort of uh, uh, schedule that well, but if you look at the English mm -hmm. Premiership based from last year to this year even, Last year, yes. they had Saturday and Sunday matches and a Monday night match. Now they have sort of two matches a night throughout the whole week because they're trying to bite into all of that TV market share. So now you can broadcast seven games in a week, get a lot of mo more money from that. So I think to your point is the sports, uh, to creating the digital experience in the sport um, helps a lot more because giving that information in there uh, all the time and adding that appeal. So. I don't know how many people still watch a full football game. They'll watch and they'll get, um, you'll need, you know, I, I do it a lot. Um, mm. uh, I, my excuse is my children because they consume a lot of time. But if you get the notifications on your phone, then you can hop quickly onto the, onto the sports channel, watch the goal, 
watch the red card, watch the missed penalty, that kind of thing. So that kind of access to information is really good. Um, but it, it's a it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we have an example from the Tour de France um, is what we do is we provide an ETA service. So there's, a, there's the official mobile app for the Tour de France, which okay. we provide an API endpoint into that uh, gives you, a, a, we estimate when the, the, first rider, the first rider will get to your specific location on the course. It returns okay. the area if you're, not, if you're not on the course, but if you're there, with, if you're within a certain distance, it'll, it'll say, cool, the, the riders will be where you are in half an hour, in an hour, whatever okay. it is. Okay. And, and if you look at the positive side of that, that's great. Because yes, then the that enhances the, the experience, surely. On the flip side, so then you know whether you can go to the shop, where, what time you need to be there. On the flip side, it tells you that you only have to be there then. So there's no, you know, if you look at all the, the stalls, the merchandising, the food stalls, the, the beer stalls, all of that on the side of the road in those fan areas, the risk to them is they'll only get people there for that little window of time, as opposed to being there the whole day, just in case, because you're not a hundred percent sure when they're going to get yes. it. So it's a double-edged sword. We give people information, giving the, uh, the risk that they, that we attract them for that little bit of time only. And that's the, the offset that the, that the, um, the owners of the product have to have to have. It's the, the awareness that the sponsors, uh, so talking to your point about sponsors, how do they then engage with that targeted window with mm -hmm. not in the knowledge that it could only be that window that they have the opportunity with which to market. So it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. And I, don't, I, think, I think as we get more into this kind of thing being a standard practice across the board um, and understanding user behavior from that perspective, uh, is how the sponsors will react. Hmm. Okay. Well, I would add, Eva. I, go if, ahead. Go ahead. If I may on the on the sponsorship formula. I think the same trend that you mentioned earlier applies to them. You know, with their like with their sponsorship money. Uh, Ten years ago, they had limited options with respect to today in terms of where to put that money. So. Um, this is uh, putting on the sports industry quite a big a challenge to come to sponsors with new offerings that go beyond, you know, having your logo showing on a screen or having your logo being uh, in, in, in a football field, uh, let's say. And the, the, the difficulty that the sports or organizations face, like think about uh, if we stick to football, yeah, think about football clubs, mm -hmm. football federations or football leagues is that most of them are not historically structured to actually offer uh, you know, digital activations. They're not, the, the, the organizational exactly. structure does not take into account that now you have to invent a digital inventory, that you have to understand you know, who, who your fans are, you know, traditionally speaking. Yes, because somehow the digital transformation has touched the fans more than the institutions. Maybe the institutions were not ready yet for this digital transformation absolutely not ready because of the monetization formula you know if, if you take mm. let's we stick to football typically a football club would make its money by selling tickets jerseys and by jerseys writing jerseys merchandising right? by selling yep. uh, commercial deals like to, to its uh, sponsors and Broadcasting by rights. Rights, yeah? either mm. it's the rights or the league sells the rights but then there is a redistribution of, of money so money was coming in, you know, whether you're doing well or not doing well, money was coming in, maybe a bit less. Yeah. But now where you have broadcasters putting more demand on the structure, sponsors putting more demand on, on the structure, fans are not coming every Sunday or every game day to the venue. Mm -hmm. The spending on jerseys is not that high uh, as, as it was in the past. This bit begs quite a serious question, you know, within the sports industry regarding what will it do to actually mm -hmm. offer all of its stakeholders with the experiences that they're looking for so that then the money flow can continue being at the rate at, at which it is today or even go, go a little bit higher. Copying old methods to gain new revenue will, will not work. You know, this, this has been 
proven in so many other other industries, and it is being um, it is being proven right now in, in in sports. It's a big, big, big topic. This one here. Yes, it is because while preparing for this, I read that uh, this has been a big influence. You know this technological change for fans and for the sponsors, but that not all in the, all the industry or all the players have followed. For example, one of the challenges is the the you know the the image right of the athletes actually you know that usually in talent management when you sign with someone for your client, you have the rights. Uh, for his picture, how many times you use it, and so on. Now with the digital e era, they this is totally somehow not under their uh, control anymore. So they need to be ready to create their own digital products as players in order to be able to monetize this. Because before that, their their uh, manager used to put in a contract that he will do two appearances after this event he will sign uh, you know uh, for the uh, fans a few uh, autographs and then he leaves you have him for an hour but now anyone can take his image sometimes even maybe unethically they can use his image certain products in you know certain countries where he cannot reach them but also it is being democratically dis distributed, as they say, and it's not like before when they used to think that the football star was inaccessible. Now he's much more accessible. And this, they still don't know how to manage. So mm -hmm. talking about the athletes and the users, I want to ask Kamel, uh, more about what he does for the users, not only the athletes, but also the common users, what his company is offering in terms of changing the experience for the users, whether they are professional sports people, whether they are adult users, or even maybe young people, the way they scout them and so on. So. Uh, so in the beginning. Uh... Hi, Kamel. Hi, how are you? So for us, really, the most important thing is to, to connect the industry, you know, with each other, because we've noticed that, you know, in the past, you know, the businesses, I mean, sports academies, sports facilities, the coaches, the instructors and the clients are connect, completely, you know, disconnected from each other. So by building an ecosystem that would bridge them all together, you know, through uh, booking platforms, for example, that would uh, automate a lot of the uh, you know, process, organization process, such as, you know, waitlist management, uh, you know, online payment that could allow the businesses to, to retain their cancellation policies and stuff like that. A lot of the headaches that, that, arrive, that arise from, you know, organizing uh, sports activities and events become, you know, uh, seamless. This is one. Okay. Uh, two, you have, you know, connecting uh, tools that would connect, you know, the coaches with the parents, with the players themselves uh, to give a lot of insights to the parents as to the progress of their children, how they're performing, uh, you know, to see uh, uh, areas of improvement, how they can collaborate with each other to, to push them even further. Uh, for adult amateurs, uh, we're trying to provide platforms to, you know, to again, uh, organize you know, games uh, to allow them to find like-minded people to join in onto their games um, and, you know, to make it more visible, you know, because, uh, I mean, the whole idea started from a football game and we used to play two times per week and we always had trouble, you know, finding people and we'd end up canceling the game just because we lacked two players. And we always thought that there were hundreds of people out there who were, you know, who wanted to play, but there just wasn't a way to reach out, you know, so... This was the first problem we tried to, to solve. And from that, we started to understand that actually the problem when we're canceling the game, yes, this is, uh, you know, uh, a, a big loss for us because we used to look forward for it, but for the venues, it's loss in revenue. Also, so exactly. More and more <clears throat> into the problems that arise at the venue. And we started realizing that capacity management is something that's very important. You know, uh, enforcing cancellation policies, 
is also very important. And so we started more and more focusing on the on the businesses rather than on the uh, consumers for the time being, you know, for at the beginning, uh, because we realized that they are the glue, you know, they are they are the way to 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 the practitioners. Uh, so that's what we're doing right now. And we're we're offering, you know, full management tools from A to Z to to manage full sports facilities, uh, you know, even sports cities you know, for their field renter, their court rentals, their academies, you know, for the registrations, uh, giving them widgets that they can embed into their own websites to receive online bookings, online uh, registrations for classes. And uh, I mean, the, the, the pillars of Into are uh, automation. So we try to automate as much as we can in the process. For a small example is waitlist management. Just imagine how much time it takes, you know, and efforts from administrators to uh, keep a list of people on the waitlist and whenever someone cancels to contact with these person, these people and to bring them into class. So if you can just automate this, it's by itself, uh, you know, uh, huge. And if you can eliminate half of the phone calls that are received by these businesses for inquiries and bookings, you know, uh, also there's a, there's a lot of uh, time saved over there that allows the businesses to focus on more on higher level rather than focus on, on the organization itself. We also provide analytics to give them, you know, full visibility over what they what they do over their business, their numbers, the trends, uh, understanding their, their customers so that they can, you know, have better strategic planning. And finally, as I said in the beginning, the connectivity, you know, just to bring in together the, the 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 whole industry you know uh, the businesses with the coaches with the with the with the with the players and the parent as well in some cases so that's that's what we do in a nutshell so from your angle the the user was ready to use this technology like we said that some some players in the industry are still not ready to move to the digital era but are the users because they are younger or even the parents how how uh, not easily used but you know how how ready were they to to move like not to call the coach by himself because the, we know that the parents like to talk to people instead yeah. of seeing results um for sure there's always resistance to change to anything specifically you know with the older generation we've noticed that yeah younger generation adopt technologies faster but uh, what was key for, uh, for the adoption of these technologies is for the business. You know, the business, we've noticed that the more the business focuses on pushing their customers to adopt these technologies, the, the better it was. Because really the big beneficiary in, 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 in this whole thing was the business and, and what it's reducing. And the beauty is that they're pushing them for something that would eventually provide convenience, accessibility, and, uh, you know, uh, they, they were positive tools that they're pushing for. But as you know, as always, you know, there is nothing that, uh, you know, people like to call, they like to ask questions, they like to communicate. So uh, it's in the beginning, it's hard, but, okay. but, but I think, you know, in, in, in some sense, uh, with all the negativity that happened with COVID-19, I think uh, it accelerated a lot this, this aspect of, uh, you know, the adoption of technology from all angles. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to move to this and ask the three of you, actually, how did you somehow benefit from COVID-19 to push this digital transformation faster? Or maybe was it somehow a setback for, for the industry? So from your point of view, Kamel, how was this challenge, you know, like the, the pandemic, was it used uh, and the benefit of of the the online let's say services or how how did gyms uh, yoga studios and all, all these services adapt when they were supposed to be shut down or with limited capacity sure sure a very good question uh, honestly at the beginning of the pandemic i thought that that, that was the end of it and that it's going to kill the industry and a lot of people also bet bet their money on that but what was amazing is how how resilient uh, the industry showed to be, and and it was noticeable. You know, not even two two days after the first lockdown, at least in Lebanon, you know, you we started to have all our studios. You know, not all of studios, but a lot of studios contact us and ask us how they can start giving online classes, and that automatically gave you know rise to to the importance of you know online booking, online online payment because there was no way to to receive the money anymore uh, physically. So online mm -hmm. payment was something that was 
that was very important. And as I said before, right before COVID, you know, the, having the businesses push their customers to book online was somewhat of a luxury. Some businesses understood its importance and were doing that, but a lot of others weren't. You know, they didn't see the value as much as when COVID-19 hit, all of a sudden they realized, okay, there's no other or way. Maybe, to- or maybe the cost was not yet justified for them because businesses look at costs as well. True, true. true. Although it's, it, it is minimal for, for, for me. I mean, mm. it's, it's more of a habit, I think, rather than the, than the cost. The cost okay. definitely plays a role, but, but the amount is, is minimal compared to the value that, uh, that is in return. And, the, and these are businesses that already use our platform, so they're already paying for our subscription but they were just not ready to take that move. And all of a sudden, you know, with COVID, so things started to, to move much faster and people started, you know, the, the user base grew because they wanted to book for classes. And uh, then again, this is on our angle, but on another- and Maybe they gained clients they, they didn't used to have because everybody was home and they wanted to, to do activities that maybe originally they were not doing and their okay. users base maybe grew as well. And, and I mean, because of they, this technology, I mean, they 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 diversified. I would rather say their user group mm. because you know they've lost some and they won some. And at by the end of it, you know, at some point in time where where restrictions were loosened, uh, you could feel the you could feel that the, they benefited from it because some people asked to keep the online classes, so they ended up you know with hybrid models, you know, uh, half in class, half half taking classes online. So yeah, in that okay. sense, they, they gained new market share, if you'd like, and people who would prefer to practice at their, their own convenience, the convenience of their own homes, they had that accessible uh, now. But, okay. but, but, but that, was, that wasn't, the, it wasn't only, you know, online classes. You can see the rise of a lot of, you know, videos on demand platforms that also, that also started, you know, coming out, such as, you know, Allo Yoga, and Allo Move, sorry, which is, uh, you know, a worldwide, you know, uh, yoga slash fitness uh, content provider you know uh, they they grew a lot of them um, you know they had a lot of momentum during covid uh, and this also pushed you know technology businesses such as into and others to start adopting and integrating technologies much faster into into their stack you know such as you know zoom integration videos on demand options to, to have them so it, it did push the industry forward uh, at least to move at a much faster pace uh, because of that you know, wearables, which were, you know, tech wearables, which are like smartwatches, which used to be, you mm. know, again, luxury for people who could, uh, you know, just use them for training became also essentials when training athletes because there was no way to, to, to monitor them, uh, you know, alive yes, and, and their distance, like yes. their breathing. And so when they had the, the wearables integrated into, into uh, you know, into the platform, the coach had quite, you know, a, a good uh, visibility over the performance of, uh, of, of these athletes and these, uh, you know, practitioners. So uh, I think these are the, the positives that, that happened to it, you know, to happen from COVID-19. And yeah. even so, uh, the, the other also benefit is that even when things loosened up, you know, the spaces opened with limited capacity. They didn't have, you know, full capacity. So all of a sudden tools like, you know, waitlist management, capacity management also became on demand. So it wasn't only to book online, but because they had to, you know, manage the capacity of... of so extra space. services were requested. Yeah. So, so all these, you know, they, they gave a very, 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 uh, you know, uh, high importance on, on, on booking platforms and management tools, you know, such as Intu and, and, and others, not just, uh, not just us. Yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, Timothy, I, I wanted to ask you, how did the training for, for the Tour de France happen during COVID? And, you know, uh, were there any obstacles? Were you able to give solutions? Uh, what happens when athletes cannot train properly properly and how can technology help them it's an it's an interesting thing because the the um i i'm sure you've all heard of the uh, platform called zwift um and i'm sure there are other ones like that but it's the only one that i know of that is used by cyclists and by runners and you basically attach Mm -hmm. your um your treadmill or your bicycle your bicycle comes with a i don't really know what it's called but a smart um, meter yes Okay. That basically, yeah, that basically 
um, uh, associates the data that you're getting from your device and puts it into the into the cloud onto the Swift platform. So it was um, the because it's compute it's computer based. You can get a lot of lot more data out of it than you can from just riding a bicycle. Um, and so that was a, they were able to train a lot using that. And it's also it's quite interesting because so the, a lot of the cyclists were doing that and and um, NTT Pro Cycling, for example, organized rides that anybody uh, across the globe could join. So they could join these professional cyclists, go on a ride. They would all be riding the same route. You could comp You know, you could see how how um, how much you know. That you, I think, one of the nice things about this kind of thing is it makes it accessible and understand how good a professional athlete actually is. Yeah, yes, you know, you want, or how lousy you are if you're not a professional athlete. <laughs> I like it the other way. <laughs> no, no, I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> you, watch, you watch a golfer, and he's he or she smashes that ball miles, and it goes straight. And you're like, oh, anybody can do that. And only once you get into that competitive environment against someone who is that good, do you appreciate their skill and their sort of athletic ability. And I think that was really good. What What's interesting from the Zwift experience, though, is it did it had it gave rise to so the Tour de France was was delayed, and mm -hmm. yes. uh, what they did is they ran a, a, a virtual Tour de France at the normal time of the around about the normal time of the Tour de France, and it was interesting because although all the cyclists had been training on these uh, on their virtual bikes, if you will, uh, there, there's actually a skill. To, ident to sort of, you know, gaming the game, if you will, because there's the in, the, in the, in the game, based on the information that it gets, it does give you credit for being able to draft, you know, like when you, when you ride behind another bicycle or a car, there's, a, there's an algorithm which gives you credit in, in how you do that. And if you don't get into the pack just right on this virtual game, it, it makes it a lot more difficult to come back from over there, so there's it, it's interesting because the um, the digital realm has it's and I haven't quite sort of uh, placed it in my head. It's but the digital realm gave the ability to train remotely for an actual race. However, it's now given wow. you know given rise to more of a um, of a, to to a new sport almost because the UCI is going to have a virtual um, is talking about I think at the moment. It's talking about a virtual race. So how do we do that? Is it, a, is it an actual thing? Um, and so on. So it's interesting that out of this pandemic, we've got, the, um, we've got these new opportunities for new sports that we've, that we've grown from. So that's quite interesting for me. The other thing that I wanted to talk yes. about, and sorry, another thing I wanted to talk about in response to your question is that uh, the, the support of the race. So typically during the Tour de France, we sit in South Africa and we support the race remotely. And that's quite normal. But now we all had to be at home. So we had to develop that, you know, so you're in an intense environment. If something goes wrong, you need to fix it. Sorry, when something goes wrong, you need to fix it quite quickly. So it's much easier if you're all in the same room, somebody can do the communicating to all the stakeholders and everybody else is fixing it. So separately, we had to make sure that everybody had the right bandwidth. We needed, you know, we have electricity issues in South Africa from time to time. Make sure you got a UPS, make sure you got backup. Uh, so everybody's separately, you know, geolocated separately so that if this person's internet and power deserted him, then this person, she could pick up and take off where he left, uh, take, pick up where he left off. So that was an interesting dilemma. And on top of that, we also provided tools for the operations of the organizers of the ASO, of the Tour de France from the ASO so that they could uh, get information quickly enough. So it was, it, was, it was similar for some of us, but vastly different for others. And they had to find new ways of getting information and communicating as well. So it gave us that yes. sort of facilities to do that, yeah. Yes, being a, a, a ready company, as they say, like because we were talking that not all companies were ready for the digital transformation. You have leveraged this challenge pretty quickly. 
And I have a question here from Facebook. Let's see who will answer it. They're saying, do you think the changing attention spans and the lifestyle of new fans should force all major sports to adapt? Esports has the potential to attract new people and deter them from actually pursuing sports careers. That's why adaptability has to be the main focus of all major sports properties. So can you comment on this, Monir? Um, absolutely, yes. Um, you know, I mean, ad adaptability is a must for all uh, industry, you know, in, in general, um, you know, for companies to broadcasting companies to online uh, conferencing uh, companies like Zoom, for example. You now, all companies have to adapt to take into account the consumer trends, to take into account the macro trends and leverage the emerging technology capabilities um, of, of, of the planet. I think the sports industry has been quite, quite innovative. I mean, if you just think about um, the camera angles, yeah, let's start from something as basic as this, you know, and if we mm -hmm. think, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago, right, 2010, and you, you pick any, any video that you can see of a football game, and you pick one today, you know, it's a, it's a whole, whole different experience, you know, just by being able to diversify the, the camera feeds using, uh, you know, higher definition cameras, so you can go closer, the audio quality and the audio, uh, the number of audio channels that is currently being used in a, in a football game, for example, is so high that, that, that any, any pr production can be made in a way to cater to the specific tastes, if you want, of communities or of individuals. So I don't think it's a question of whether sports needs to adapt. I think it's it's a must. It has to adapt. How does that adaption, uh, adaptation, I think? Adaptation, yes. <laughs> How does that adaptation take place? Um, you know, will uh, we'll, uh, we'll determine, you know, how quick can a specific sports property or a specific sports, whether we're talking about cycling or motorsports or football or cricket or diving or swimming, to yes. capture the, the attention and to capture the economy of the generations to come, but also like the, the, the current generations, you know, who are, who are yes. already spending, spending their money. And as a, as a CEO of a consulting firm, you are, somehow in between the sports properties, the sponsors, the technological, you know, service providers. And did you notice a certain spin or rising interest of the sponsors with the COVID crisis? Or was it like the opposite? Because we know that an empty field is not interesting for a sponsor, but we also know that a very high, you know, uh, rate of uh, viewership on TV and online is very interesting for him. So how did somehow COVID affect the engagement of a sponsor? And how was this, you know, do, if you have figures, I know it's too early, but did this affect the, the revenue generation for, for either the clients or the interested sponsors? So... The coronavirus, um, you know, ever since the, the breakout early this year has been a very serious wake up call to, to, the, to the sports uh, sector. There are specific challenges that the, that the whole industry was trying to determine how to face. Yeah. When, what, one of the challenges was, for example, um, how do we bring more people on into the, uh, into the, the stadium? Yeah. Or, if, you know, in, in the sports language is how do we put butts on seats, basically. Mm -hmm. no, and it was, it was a problem even before coronavirus hit because, you know, there were like lower and lower and lower numbers uh, over the years. Now, all of a sudden, yes. uh, the industry needed to face a situation where not only uh, that number is zero, right? Because no one can go, but now there are no games anymore. Yes. So the only product, but the, the, the main product that many, many organizations relied on, which was the event happening, all of a sudden disappeared. And all of a sudden there was this big gap. Yeah. It's all of a sudden the lights are exactly. off and, and the show is off. <laughs> the show is off and very few organizations had the, the light, some light switches to turn on here and there. 
The only ones who are able to turn on some light switches are the ones who have invested previously on all of their digital infrastructure and digital architecture so that they establish a one-to-one -one communication with all of their fans and stakeholders. To answer your question, Ava, the sponsor wants to be visible. A sponsor wants to tell stories. A sponsor wants to interact with the community. So if you are one of the most prominent sports properties that has relied exclusively on having the game happening or the event happening so that you can broadcast it live and capture content and put it on all of your social media channels, well, all of a sudden you are at a very big uh, disadvantage because one, the show was not happening and two, you had not invested on actually understanding what is the email address and name and last name of my fan? All you know is that you have millions and millions of followers on Instagram and Facebook and mm -hmm. YouTube, but you don't know who they so are. You cannot reach them. You cannot reach them. On the flip okay. side, sports properties, whether they're big or small, and there are examples in, in, in both, you know, very, very small sports organizations and very big who have had, who have simple tools like a CRM mm -hmm. that is properly populated and that is properly organized where, and that have digital platforms to communicate, we're able to tell stories, we're able to engage fans and communities, we're able to bring value to the sponsors, even when to, the show was on. And off. to keep the relationship going while the, nothing was happening, yes. Many, many teams started involving their staff, you know, so mm. uh, the, the, there are fantastic shows right now, if you go look, look them up online on, for example, how chefs cook for an athlete, how physiologists work with an athlete, you know, what does a travel agent do usually for an athlete, you know, in in-house experiences, real experiences, that the team and the club and the property understands that if I'm able to generate content and bring my community closer to me while we figure out, you know, whether we're going to be hosting games and so on. I'm bringing value to everyone and I'm maintaining my value. Yeah. Which, um, yes. So, Very so smart. I, I think, I mean, digital and tech are our key assets that once used properly can bring massive value. Sponsors put big lots of pressure. Sponsors will continue putting lots of, uh, lots of pressure. And, you know, I, I think it's really the, the, the responsibility of the sports properties to take it onto themselves that they have to uh, start that journey if they haven't started. It's not a question of whether you should or you should not. You know, it's it's just when you start it. Okay. The more you, de you delay, the lesser value you will be able to capture in in the future. There's no no doubt about that. Yep. Okay. So we still have 10 minutes. I'm sorry to, to tell you this because we're switching to Arabic later on. <laughs> so we'll have uh, just a second. We'll have Sharif Kutub joining us for the second part of the talk. But we do that. I just need to ask you, each one of you, if you, they, you can tell me what's, for you, what's next for the next five years? like. We talked once while preparing for this, how the Spanish league has partners with the EA, EA Sports, you know, uh, for the online and, you know, the, the sound, the cheering sound of the, the, there are many things being used that we never thought it would be used. We never thought that a football game on TV will need a live cheering for a, from an e-sport game to, to feel more lively, but these partnerships are happening. In your opinion, the three of you, what is next? Each one in his like expertise, where do you imagine things? What is the role of augmented reality? Uh, what are the beta tests you know about? So Munir, Timothy and Kamel. Shall I Who begin? Wants to go first? Yes, go ahead, Kamel. Okay. You're the youngest, so you start first. <laughs> Am I? Yes, I you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you mentioned a, a very important keyword, you know, like augmented reality. Uh, you know, I, I think there are a few few key keywords that will play a big role, you know, AR, like you said, augmented reality, 
artificial intelligence, virtual reality, you know, and the more we understand about the brain, also the more this these advancement will, will, will start happening. But I won't be surprised, and that's not maybe something within the next five years, but maybe 10 to 15 years, I won't be surprised if we get to a point where we are physically located at home, but playing a football game, you know, with friends, and it, 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 it looks real, you know, uh, you know, you're doing the movement, you're burning the calories, you're doing everything, except that everything is being fed into your brain and, uh, you know, the sensors. Uh, yes. The... Yeah. So, and I think we're going to be moving more and more toward this, this direction. This is the direction that we're going to be heading toward, where we will be in, a, in this regards in five years, how far? I'm not so sure because you know how exponential the technologies are are, are moving uh, you know could uh, one 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 breakthrough could you know make us jump uh, jump to it right away uh, already there are you know uh, fitness mirrors it's like you know they call it you know like a home gym that you can install at home it's a mirror uh, that is your personal coach and it gives you the training and while doing the training it 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 can it can measure how you're doing the exercise, you know, uh, even, you know, in, in a case where eventually you can maybe do it for tennis or for, for golf, it could check your swing, it can see the deviations, the little angles that you're doing wrong, and it can, it could fix, fix, uh, you know, the, your, your posture, fix uh, the whole swing. So uh, wow. I think, yeah, and this is already live, you know, we have, you know, again, it's called Mirror, a technology called Mirror that was acquired by Lululemon for about half a billion uh, ah, okay. it happened you know and ga they, it gained a, a lot of momentum now during COVID you know it, a lot of exposure although they had started maybe in 2018 but you know COVID gave them the the highlight right away and so I wouldn't be surprised if this could start you know rolling over uh, across different sports discipline and not just uh, fitness uh, but but I in, in in my personal you know opinion you know I can see you know technology is doing one of two uh, roles you know either you know completely uh, replacing uh, you know coaches or replacing uh, you know uh, social interaction or I can see it as enhancing the experience and enhancing the coaching uh, because I, I think you know humans are social beings and they like to interact with yes. other people. So from my angle, at least on, uh, in into, I will be pushing technology in that direction, you know, to again, more and more enhance the experience, eliminate headaches yes. that are associated with, uh, you know, with, with, with uh, events, games, activities in general, and just, you know, have people focus on what they love to do, you know, the sports itself, coach, you know, perform the coach, because I think the, the human element is very important. So by empowering a coach, with it, an AI tool, you know, and then combining that with the knowledge of the coach, I think could be much more powerful than just having, you know, a, a, a virtual coach, uh, an augmented, I mean, uh, yeah, an AI coach. That's at least my take on that. Okay. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll put on Camel just because he, he mentioned the word coach and, and AI, um, just to, to share with you mm. a quick story. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, at one of the uh, uh, conferences that, that happen on a yearly basis, uh, specifically here in Europe called the Sports Innovation Summit. Um, I had the chance to moderate a one-on-one -on -one Q and A with uh, Arsene Wenger, uh, one, one of the most yeah. prominent uh, football coaches yes. of, of the world, yeah? And one of my questions yeah. for him was, you know, what does the coach of the future look like? You know, um, what, what skill sets does that coach need to have? And he yeah. said, that coach, needs to be a tech guru who understands a little bit about it. but the main understanding that that person need to have is one determine what are all of the capabilities that the technological world can offer me today what are all of the millions of data points that i can measure from one specific football game and then what is that one question that I need to find a very quick answer to before the coach of the other team does. So mm. that, and then that's it. You know, knowledge of football, good, but not, not, not as necessary as it was in, in the past. You know, such powerful words coming from such a prominent figure in football, you know, who is, you know, at, at a very, very advanced age as well. Yes, yes, exactly. But he's a, he's like an icon. 
He's in Eichmann. He's I would a... have imagined he would say like, you just need emotional intelligence because he has so much of it. So I wouldn't imagine such an answer from him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I, I think right now the work that he's doing at, at FIFA is fantastic. And him being a visionary mm -hmm. like he is, I think he will uh, bring lots into, into the, uh, the football industry. Um, but I, I really yeah. think that in the next five to 10 years, you know, specifically thanks to the accelerator that happened in that is happening in coronavirus, the, the sports industry in general will change much quicker than what it was in the past. You know, mm -hmm. so if... In the last 10 years, if you talk to any football analyst, they will tell you that GPS was the main um, the yes, that influenced mostly the, the transformed everything. World. Yeah, I think between here and the next five years, we're going to have at least two to three technologies that will influence simultaneously. It's not just going to be to be one. Mm. Before, before we get Timothy's opinion on what are the technologies that will influence, there's a final question that came to me. You know, a lot of people are watching on Facebook and they're feeding me the questions here. So there's a question asking what sport or sport team do you think was the best suited, best to adapt to the digital transformation, Tim uh, Timothy? And then you tell us what's, what's next in the tech world for sports. So, uh, so it's an interesting question, and um, uh, it depends on uh, the time frame that they're talking about. I think the, the ability mm -hmm. to adapt to the digital transformation is, so the key thing for any digital transformation is, is uh, to try and consolidate the sources of your data. Because if you have too many disparate mm -hmm. forms of data and sources of data coming in, it becomes very complicated to consolidate that and provide any meaningful output. So to Munir's point where he was talking about Arsene Wenger consolidating all those bits of data, mm. if you, um, and obviously, uh, so, so yeah, to, to have a nice consolidated uh, infrastructure and the ability to get all of those sources of data into a meaningful form, that's going to be the key thing. So I think the sport that was able to uh, I think that if you if you if I think of all the sports of which I'm familiar and and I'm interested to find out if any other sports, the one that I think that has shown the most sort of tech savviness is going to be, for my for my money is is Formula One, because yes. if you look at the the intense technology that's in there, if you look at a steering wheel, it's not a round thing with a horn in the middle. It's it's far more complicated than that, right? Uh, and and the, the ability of the driver to make changes on the fly while they you know, fly literally while they're going around that course to see what they've got to change in their brakes and this is I, I don't know the mind boggles and what they can change so I think they've been the leading uh, light obviously they have the advantage of lots of they've been lots ahead of actually yes they do have a lot of money to which with which they can play with so but I think that that helps but having that vision and, and trying to, and that competitive drive all the time to get that information, I think has helped um, the motorsport industry. And I think that, uh, I think that if, I, if I go back to Kamal's point earlier about, um, the, I think the form and where he was going about the coach and the AI and talking about that. And I think if we extend that and we say, and we look at that, info, and, and the, the, I like the idea of uh, sort of, tweaking your brain to make you think that you are running or something like that you know it, it, that kind of information is quite yes. interesting and I think what for me what it does is it blurs the lines between actual sports and virtual and sort of e-sport and I think the uh, one of the problems that traditional sports people have is that they don't think that e-sport is necessarily a sport and then you look at the training that the people that e-sports practitioners put in and the, the toll on their body and the mental training that they have to do in, to in order to succeed in that environment. And I think there's the spectrum of physical sport to e-sport, that spectrum is going to grow across there. So there's not, there's not such a big gap. And then we've got sort of like virtual sport, like the Zwift training. I think there's going to be, that spectrum is going to grow across like that. So being able to, uh, you know, if you take, if you take like uh, the gaming console, the Wii, and you could play tennis, but mm, typically yes. it's on the same console against someone here. 
but potentially you're going to play tennis against someone anywhere else in the world. Uh, and you, you go to Carmel's point where Online, you just... Yes. You just log in and you find someone, you know, like, like you can do with words with friends. You go and you go and play with someone against someone else. Like they're doing I, with e-gaming now. And now you can play tennis and now you can play football where you consolidate 22 players, you know, if you want to play a full game or 10 players for an indoor game. And nobody's in the same space, but they're all playing against each other on two teams and they've got all the right kind of stuff. So there's, and there's, there's you know, we're, de we're working with a project now where we have a smart garment and that vest can tell you not just the normal biometrics of heart rate and VO2 things, but also your posture. And because it's got accelerometers on it and which way you're leaning and, you know, that kind of thing. So that kind of information fed into that kind of world bring, sort of makes it much easier to blur all of those lines across the range. And I think that's where we're going to go in the, in the next five years, where it becomes accessible to, to a wide range, a variety of people. And just, just one little more, one more point <laughs> is that um, being online has facilitated a lot of lives. So um, like a friend of mine, he's in a wheelchair, but he wrote a book because he can do it online. And his, you know, his, his muscles don't work, but he wrote a book. So imagine those kinds of people can now participate in sport, you know, so, so it breaks the sort of the barrier to entry for, to sport for a lot of people, because now you can just use your brain to play sport and you don't have to be a physical, uh, physically able to talk or yes. whatever, you know, whatever your physical ability, it now can change. So I think that realm it becomes a lot more accessible. Sport becomes a lot more accessible to someone who's not the fastest runner at school or the, who can kick the ball, but now it becomes a different set of skills. And I think that's, that's where, so the digital world into the sports world right now is sort of breaking it into bite-sized chunks, but in the future might make it a lot more accessible to people to which it wasn't accessible before. That would be great. And having, you know, the same exactly. effect of endorphins, yeah. that would be even better. <laughs> Knowing yeah, that it makes people happy. And this is actually, that's why sports is so exciting for everyone. Because whether you're practicing or you're watching, it, it has this ability to make you happier, stay with people, be a sociable person. And these are, you know, the characteristics Characteristics and playing and be a team player and we really want technology to enhance this because these are the the actual faculties of sports and the essence so i want to thank you all i know that kamel is staying with us munir will try to stay with us timothy thanks a lot you've been thank a you great help me. thank you very and much very valuable information and Thank you for joining us. But okay. we're switching to Arabic now. I don't think it would be interesting <laughs> for you. <laughs> I'd love to stay, but and I don't think I'll, I'll uh, understand much. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Thank you. you Thanks speak, a lot. If you speak sign language, you can. We have Russia, <laughs> but still. OK, we have Basant now taking over with uh, her friend from Hi. Egypt, Sharif. Hi, Basant. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you very, very much for this extremely interesting, extremely interesting uh, event. I really um, um, would like to thank you, Eva, also for, for organizing such an innovative idea with such a panel. Thank you very, very much for that. مساء الخير عليكم yes. كلكم وعلى الناس اللي لسه متابعانا. آه انا النهارده سعيده جدا ان آه معايا آه خبير رياضي من مصر، هو اصلا محامي ومحامي متخصص كمان بالشراكه الالمانيه المصريه، لكن النهارده بصفته كوتش وخبير رياضي آه احب ان انا آه اتكلم معاه شويه على تاثير الكورونا على الرياضه في مصر. وهو الحقيقه واحنا بنحضر للندوه دي كلمني على يعني حاجات كتيره قوي اتغيرت دلوقتي حاجات يمكن لها او كان لها تاثير سلبي الكورونا فيها بس حاجات كتير تانية كان لها تاثير ايجابي جدا عليها شريف بليز ان ميوت يور سيلف وخلينا نسمع صوتك وبسنت في معك كامل ومنير بقيو سو اثنيناتهم بيحكوا عربي ويو كان طبعا شو بيقولوا
تاخذوا اراء بعضكم انا اي ويل ميوت ماي سيلف واسمعكم طيب يلا شريف احكي لنا شويه ايه اللي بيحصل في مصر من ناحيه الرياضه والاول ممكن نتكلم عن المشاكل اللي حصلت لما الكورونا ابتدت وبعدين دلوقتي التاثير الايجابي اوكي في الاول انا سعيد ان انا معاكم وممكن نقول على ان اللي حصل اول ما حصل الكورونا حصل لوك داون عمل اغلاق لكل المنشات الرياضيه في مصر وبالتالي ما بقاش في انكم ما بقاش في جيم ما بقاش في اي سبورتس بتتعمل فابتدى يحصل ادابتيشن اللي هو التكيف بقى مع الموقف الجديد اللي بقى موجود ابتدت نشوف ان في نشاط جامد قوي في موضوع الاونلاين شوبينج اللي هو الناس بتشتري المعدات الرياضيه بقى كل الناس عندها اكويبمنت في البيوت لدرجه ان بقى في معظم الشوبس سولد اوت كل حاجه ما بقاش فيه الاكويبمنتس ومعظم الاكويبمنتس الرياضيه مستورده مش مصنعه محليا في مصر فبالتالي ابتدى يبقى ما فيش خلاص اكويبمنتس فالناس عايزه تعمل رياضه ما فيش معدات فابتدى يبقى في حل لوكال ابتدى يبقى في مصانع كده صغيره تبتدي تصنع المعدات الرياضيه و لدرجة إن في إحصاءات مثلا من جونيا مثلا قالوا إن إن معدل المبيعات بتاعتها أونلاين في مصر زادت 80% في بداية الكوفيد يعني وده بالنسبة للجيمات طبعا لوك داون فابتدى يبقى في تخفيض للمرتبات 50% لكل العاملين في الجيم في الجيمز والصالات الرياضية بعد كده هم ابتدوا يعملوا تخفيض عشان ما حدش عارف هو اللوك داون هيقعد قد ايه. الموضوع طول شويه دخلنا في الشهر الثالث ابتدى يبقى في تسريح للعماله اللي هي مثلا بيشتغلوا في الاوبريشن. الترينرز ابتدوا يعملوا ادابتيشن بقى مع الموقف وابتدوا يعملوا اونلاين تريننج. فابتدى يبقى في انكم ابتدى يبقى في شغل مع الاونلاين تريننج ابتدى يبقى في تريننج ثرو الفيديو كولز. عشان يتابعوا الكلاينتس بيلعبوا بيعملوا التمارين صح تو افويد انجريز عشان ما يبقاش في اصابات ده عمل تطور يعني ليهم وخلاهم يحافظوا على الانكم بتاعهم. بالنسبه ل ابتدى يبقى في حلول بديله للجيم ابتدى الناس في مصر احنا عندنا في مصر يعني ما كانش الثقافه بتاعت الرياضه اللي هي الاوت دور اللي هي زي الجوجينج والرانينج والووكينج ما كانش بيحصل. ابتدى ده سلولي كده يبتدي يظهر وابتدى يبقى الناس بقت كتير في الشوارع بتعمل التمارين. ده برضو خلى الناس تبتدي تعمل زي جروبس وبيعملوا ترانسفير الداتا مع بعضيهم مين عمل ايه النهارده فابتدى يبقى في تشالنجز ان هم يعملوا اكتر فابتدى الفتنس ليفل بيزيد فتحمسوا بعضيهم لحد ما ظهرت السايكلينج بقى والدراجات الدراجات دي حصل فيها طفره في مصر لدرجه ان حصل زياده في مبيعات الدراجات وفقا للتصريحات بتاعت غرفه تجاره القاهره 50% وفي خلال شهرين كل الدراجات سولد اوت ما بقاش فيه في السوق المصري دراجات وبالتالي ابتدى يبقى فيه برضه فرص استثماريه بقى في مصانع بتفتح علشان تعمل عجل محليا عشان تبقى اسعار رخيصه لان الاسعار بتاعته غاليه جدا يعني الافريج ريت بيبقى 3000 جنيه فده خلى وزارة الشباب في مصر تعمل مبادرة اسمها درجتك أو درجتك صحتك أو عجلتك صحتك المبادرة دي بتعمل دعم 25% لسعر الدراجة يعني وفي إمكانية تقسيط يعني الباقي وابتدى نشوف مبادرة جديدة اسمها سكتك خضراء دي تبع <تصفيق> دي تبع برنامج الأمم المتحدة و الحكومة المصرية مع سفارة الدنمارك. المبادرة دي بقى دي جميلة جدا. المبادرة اسمها كتير حلو. 
اه اسم كثير مهضوم يعني الاسم بحمسك تكتك خضرا هي جامل جرين بتاع الجرين انرجي وكده فالمبادره مش بس ان هي توفر دراجات بسعر رخيص لا هي كمان بتوفر او بتعمل الاماكن باركينج للعجل اه النوادي والجامعات <تصفيق> وبرضه بت... ب... هدفها برضه تعمل طرق ولينز للعجل لان هي مش موجوده عندنا في حتت بسيطه قوي. <تصفيق> فدي كان لحد ما ابتدى اللوك داون ي... ي... يخف بقى جزئي ابتدى <تصفيق> بقى الجيمز الجيمات والصالات الرياضيه عاملين زي السوشيال ميديا بت... بيتواصلوا مع الاعضاء بتوعهم. دايما كانوا على طول بيتواصلوا معاهم في حكايه ان هم ازاي طرق الوقايه، طرق ازاي يعملوا تعقيم، ازاي يحافظوا على الفتنس، ازاي يحافظوا على لياقتهم. لحد بعد كده ابتدى الجيمات تفتح فابتدت كل الجيمات الماجورتي يعني ابتدوا في طبعا رولز كانت ان ما ينفعش منشاه او او اي كيان يعني سواء رياضي او اي شركه تشتغل فول كاباسيتي. فلازم الشغل يبقى 25% فعلشان يسيطروا على ال 25% دي ابتدى يبقى في ابلكيشنز تو بوك يور ورك اوت فبقى في زي سكاجول ساعتين لعدد معين وبعد الساعتين بيبقى في نص ساعه يقفلوا الجيم يعملوا تطهير وتعقيم ويفتحوا للعدد الجروب اللي بعده فده ده الديجيتاليزيشن او الحرب ساعه يعني قبل قبل ما ما تناقل بسؤالي لكامل هل الناس كانت متقبله بسرعه موضوع الفيديوز والاونلاين تريننج وان يعني هل كان في وازاي الترينرز في مصر قدروا ان هم يكتسبوا المهارات دي ان هم يعملوا الفيديوز ويعملوا التدريب تريننج ايه اللي حصل وايه السرعه اللي يعني اللي كانت موجوده خلت الديجيتاليزيشن او التكنولوجيز تبقى مستخدمه من سواء الترينر او الناس اللي بتتدرب هي الديجيتال كانت موجوده اوريدي بس بنسبه ضئيله يعني كان في ناس بتجتهد في ناس حابه يبقى هو يوتيوبرز وبيعمل فيديوز عن التريننج وفي اللي بيعمل اونلاين بروجرامز برضه بس بسيطه الـ 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 الكورونا او الكوفيد عملت بوش يو هاف يو هاف تو ادابت بقى مع فبقى الموضوع ابتدى بالتدريج يبقى في طبعا ترينرز يعملوا فيديوز على اليوتيوب ويعملوا اونلاين تريننج بعد شهرين ثلاثه ابتدى بقى عدد الترينرز اكثر من من اللي بيمارسوا الرياضه يعني بيعملوا أيه. فيديوز فالموضوع بقى زياده شويه بس الناس أيه. كانت متقبله طبعا اوكي تمام كامل انت كنت حكيت لنا ان الفكره دي ان بالذات موضوع السايكلينج ان انت كنت زي عملت كونسلتيشن لبعض الجيمز ان هم ياجروا ال العجل بتاعهم بدل ما ان هم قافلين ومحدش بيدفع فاحكي لنا شويه عن الفكره دي ازاي انت طورتها وازاي حكايه السوفت وير اللي بقيت ان انت برضو ازاي الجيم يقدر يتحكم في السبيس اللي موجود شريف قال 25% بس كاباسيتي فازاي ازاي انت كنت بتعمل كونسلتيشن للجيمز علشان يقدروا ان هم ينفذوا الحاجات دي اول شيء على الفكره تبع ال ال الجيم اللي عنده بايسكلز لاجرهم كان يعني مثل ما قلت لك بعد ما صار اللوك داون مش كل العالم فهمت قديش حتاخذ وقت هاللوك داون يعني في عالم استوعبوها من اول لحظه في عالم استوعبوها بعد ثلاث اشهر سو so, انا اللي صار معي انه عندي تو ثري كلاينتس من تبعولي من الاول دغري لاحظوا شو هي وبلشوا يطلعوا اونلاين سو so, انا صرت مسؤوليتي بلش دق لكل الكلاينتس تبعولي واحكي لهم وقول لهم انه هيك 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 عم بيصير وهيك عم هيك عم بيعملوا الكلاينتس تبعولنا وانه نحن بننصحكم تعملوا زيت الشيء واحد من منهم اللي هي اللي هن دي اوفر سايكلينج اذا بدك سايكلينج كلاسز مش سايكلينج شو بسموها؟ uh, 
سبينينج ثانك يو ثانك يو سبينينج قالت لي بس انا عندي ما بايكس تبعولي يعني ما ما فيني ما فيهم يقعدوا يعملوا بايكس قلت لها ليش ما بتاجريهم؟ قالت لي ما بركي ما بيستاجرون بيستاجرون قلت لها جربي وبالفعل يعني بعد ثلاث ايام حكيت لي قالت لي اجرت كل البايكس تبعولي يعني العالم كانت دغري اوتوماتيكلي كمان فهموا انه لا هذا الشيء حيطول ودغري يعني استوعبوا الوضع وبس انا اي كريدت يعني بتصور اللي قلت قبل لما سالتني حتى ايفا انه الادابتيشن صارت من الكونسيومر من البراكتشنر بحد ذاته ولا من البزنس قلت لها دائما انا بالنسبه لي البزنس هو الدرايفنج كورس البزنس لما هي بوت ات اوت ذير وحكي مع الستودنتس تاعولهم يعني دغري اوتوماتيكلي فهموا الوضع و ات جوت امبلمنتد بسرعه يعني وهيدا الشيء لما هيدا صارت وقالت لي انه انا اجرت البايكس فهمت هون انه لا انه هيدا الشيء فيري فيزبل بس از لونج از البزنس هو اوير عليها وبيعرف كيف يقدر تو بوش هيز هيز كاستمرز على الـ على الاونلاين كلاسز هلا نحن كيف ساعدنا ثاني سؤال الجزء الثاني من سؤالك نحن كيف بنساعد نحن بكل صف ولا بقلب الجيم فينا نحدد نحن قديش الماكسيموم كاباسيتي اوكي سو بالعادي اذا صف بساعة 30 هلا صاروا بلبنان كانوا تقريبا وصلوا على ال 55% وحتى في مرات 25% سو so هن بس بمحل واحد بغيروا بالسوفت وير قديش بيقدر يساع ماكسيموم بقلب الصف ساعتها لما يجوا عالم عم بيحجزوا اذا كان صار الكلاس فول بصفي ما بقى عندك كبسه بوك ناو بصفي جو تو ويت جو اون ويت ليست وبصير الشخص بفوت اون ذا ويت ليست ولما حدا يجي يكنسل قبل بوقت مثلا يلغي محله من الصف اوتوماتيكلي الشخص الاول واحد على الويت ليست از نوتيفايد وبفوت الشخص الاول على الصف وفانس اند سو اون اند سو فورث وهون بصف وهون صارت كثير مهمه قصه الكنسليشن بوليسي لانه بالزمانات اذا حدا حجز وكنسل دي كنسل مش هالقد مهمه لانه مرات دي يعني بيجي حدا ثاني محله بس هون لا يعني اول ما صارت الك... اول ما رجعوا بلشوا يخففوا الريستريكشنز تبع كوفيد 19 العالم يعني صراحه هجمت رجعت على الجيمات وعلى استوديوز يعني مش بس عم شوفها تقريبا بكل البزنسز اللي عم نشتغل معهم صار في لانه صار كاباسيتي اذا بدك 25% و50% صار دائما دائما عم يشتغلوا ات اوفر كاباسيتي فصار الويت ليست مانجمنت صار كثير اساسي بالبروسس تبعهم اوكي شريف هل ده برضه غير شويه المينتاليتي في مصر وخلى وقرب الرياضه شويه يعني هل التكنولوجيا قربت شويه الرياضه من الشباب وحتى الناس اللي اكبر سنا؟ اه ده فعلا ده حصل وملحوظ جدا حتى في الشارع المصري يعني ابتدى نشوف جروبس بتاع ناس كبار في السن راكبين عجل ابتدى نشوف دلوقتي بقى في استخدام اللي هي الابلكيشنز بتاعت السايكلينج زي شرافا اللي هو بيحسب المايلز والهارت ريت والحاجات دي ابتدوا يجمعوا بعضيهم ونشوفهم يعني زي سمول ايفنتس كده مع بعضيهم والثقافه انتقلت للشارع بقى في موضوع السواقه في العربيات ابتدوا يسيبوا سبيس للعجل كان الاول ما فيش الاول ما كانش فيه مساحه خالص للدرجه كانت عمليه انتحاريه ان انت تركب عجله في كانش حد بيفكر حد <تصفيق> بيفكر وبعد كده ابتدى يعني المصريين ابتدوا ابتديت اشوف اجانب كمان ابتدوا يحسوا ان الموضوع سيف وبيركبوا دراجات في مصر يعني في القاهره ده تطور حلو قوي آه كامل هل انت في كندا شايف اي اختلاف او اي بيست براكتس اكزامبل انت عايز تحكي لنا عليه انت شفته في كندا وممكن ان احنا ننفذه او او قطاع الرياضه او البيزنس اللي خاص بالرياضه في مصر او في لبنان يقدر ينفذه بسهوله صراحه أه انا من من شو شفت انه الرياكشن اللي صارت على موضوع الكوفيد تقريبا يونيفرسال وانا بعرف لانه انا مرت عندها يوجا ستوديو وهي اول شخص يعني ثاني نهار انا بس صارت الكوفيد لبدت يعني على الكنبايه وقلت لحظه شوي انا اذا الاندستري اتحطمت انا بتحطم معها يعني ودغري طلعت هيك لمبه ضوت اللمبه براسها انه خلص انا بدي اعطي اونلاين كلاسز وافتكرت حالها انه انوفيتور يعني <تصفيق> فتنا اونلاين دغري وي ستارتد جوجلينج وشفنا انه والله بهالبلد صار في اونلاين كلاسز وبهونيك باونلاين كلاسز سو ات واز ا ناتشرال رياكشن حسيت ان كل واحد فات بسرفايفل انستنكت مود تبعه وبلش اول رياكشن كانت انه اونلاين اونلاين كلاسز سو 
في ولما جيت لهون لاحظت انه في كثير في كثير سيميلاريتيز هلا مثل ما كانوا عم بيقول مستر شريف على موضوع الاوت دور اكتيفيتيز هون صار في كثير كمان يعني جروث على هالموضوع وقول هون ان جنرال السايكلينج شيء كثير معتمد فيه وفي عندك لينز في عندك هيك سو هذا الشيء ما تغير بس اللي مثلا بلش يصير صاروا العالم يروحوا على الباركس على الجن مشان يعملوا تريننج وان اون وان سيشنز مع الكوتش تبعهم يعني مم. كل مره انا هون بروح على البارك شوف ثلاثه اربعه جروبات اثنين ثلاثه عم 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 بيتدربوا عم بيتدربوا سوا سو دغري استفادوا من الاوت دور سبيسز لحتى يقدروا يعملوا التمرينات تبعونهم هيدي الشغله هون شفتها بس كمان آه. شفتها بلبنان وشفتها وين ما كان يعني ما عم بقدر فكر بشيء سبيشل آه غير انه شغله وحده بس كمان ما زبطت معهم هون انه الجمعيه الجيمات والاستوديوز يعني قاموا لقيامي على موضوع اللوك داون انه بالنسبه لهم فيزيكال هيلث از كثير مهم واساسي لمناعه الانسان لتحميه من الكوفيد 19 سو so نحن اليوم لما عم نيجي نسكر هذا الجيم عم نخفف عم نخلي هالعالم ما يتدربوا عم 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 ناذيهم عم نعرضهم اكثر لل للامراض وجربوا انه يفتحوا الجيمات ريجاردلس من اللوك داون بس ما ما قدروا ما ما طلع بايدهم يعملوا بس ما بعرف قد ايه بعد بتكفي يعني هيك كثير عم بيصير في اخذ وعطى بين بين الجمعيه بين 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 وبين الدوله مشان يقدروا يلاقوا حلول على اندر ذا بريتكس انه الاميونيتي سيستم تبعنا هو دايركتلي لينكت على الفيزيكال ويل بين تبعنا ف ان شاء الله يكون من هونيك يعملوا شيء أم السؤال الجاي اللي عندي بخصوص الداتا طبعا ان الرياضه زي ما احنا سمعنا في الجزء الاول داتا وبيج داتا وداتا اناليسيز دلوقتي ويل شيف ذا فيوتشر بتاعه الرياضه وهتحسن من 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 قطاعات كثيره فيها هل الموضوع ده وصل برضه في مصر وبدا يبقى بتلاقي الجيمز او مثلا في كونكشن جامده ما بين الجيمز والديجيتال هيلث مثلا سيكتور في مصر يا شريف يعني هل بداوا القطاعات دي بالذات الديجيتال هيلث ابلكيشنز وقطاع الرياضه يبتدوا يتعاونوا شويه في الموضوع ده ده بالفعل ده حاصل فعلا هو كان موجود طبعا موضوع ال ان كل واحد بيبقى عنده اللي هي الساعه الديجيتال اللي بتقيس عشان يعرف الليفل بتاع الهارت ريت وكده بس حاليا هو خلاص بقى حاجه طبيعيه جدا وتبادل المعلومات بين الجيم والممبرز بتوع الجيم ده بقى بقى حاجه يعني مفروغ منها بتحصل وبقى يعني بقى الغريب ان هي مش موجوده دلوقتي بقى طبيعي انها موجوده فده موجود كده وهيزيد اكيد ومتخيل ان دلوقتي انت انت مدرب يعني خدت طبعا دبلومات عشان تبقى مدرب محترف وكوتش هل تفتكر ان في 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 المستقبل لازم يبقى في ديجيتال كومبوننت يعني لازم اللي هو الديجيتال سكيلز تدخل في 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 التعليم في في الجزء التعليمي عشان تبقى مدرب لان حتى لو ان شاء الله ربنا يسهل والسنه الجايه تكون الكورونا دي اختفت او قدرنا ان احنا نخفيها هل هتتخيل ان برضو هتفضل الديجيتال فورمات والفيديوز وزي كمان ما كامل قال المرايه اللي بالاي اي هل الحاجات دي هتنتشر ولا انتوا متخيلين الناس هت زي ما انت خدت الكلمه دي قلت هجوم هيهجموا تاني هيهجموا تاني على الجيمز وكل الحاجات دي هتتنسي ومش عايزين نفتكرها تاني لا هو طبيعي ده ده هيحصل بس في حاجات صعبه تتبدل او تتغير يعني مثلا طبعا التكنولوجيا هتخش في كل حاجه ده ممكن انا شايف ان هي ما عدا في حاجه بسيطه يعني اللي هي مثلا الترينر اه ممكن يبقى في ترينر باخد منه الانفورميشنز او ديجيتال ترينرز زي ما بنقول بس انا از بروفيشنال برضو كنت اوقات وانا بتمرن محتاج حد يديني موتيفيشن يشجعني فدي النقطه دي الوحيده اللي ممكن هتبقى مش صعبه يعني نلاقي بديل ليها انما كداتا ك اكسبلينينج كل ده لا ده ممكن ممكن هيحصل 
طيب اخر سؤال لي ليك يا كامل وبعدين انا عارفه احنا النهارده تطولنا شويه دلوقتي انت مثلا قلت ادي الاكزامبل بتاعت المرايه اللي بال بالاي اي بالاي ار اوكي والحاجات دي كلها الاكزامبلز اللي احنا اتكلمنا عليها النهارده كلها محتاجه استثمار محتاجه فلوس محتاجه ان ان سواء المستهلك او البزنس They they have to invest money. لازم يستثمروا في الحاجات دي. فهل شايف إن في تقبل للفكرة دي في وقت صعب جدا يعني هما من ناحية لازم يقفلوا الجيمس وكده ومن ناحية تانية لازم يحاولوا يستثمروا في ال في ال في ال user experience وفي في equipment أكتر وفي digital يعملوا digital transformation للجيمس بتاعتهم. فهل شايف تعارض أو تقبل للفكرة وإيه من وجهة نظرك الحاجات اللي هي هتبقى أساسية وممكن حاجات تانية تبقى اختيارية تيجي on a midterm ولا long term مثل ما قال قبل منير لما نسأل هالسؤال تقريبا بيشبهه أنه اليوم التقبل تبع هيدا الشيء هو أساسي يعني اللي أنا بالنسبة لي اللي ما حيتقبل هيدا الشيء ما حيضاين ايفنشلي و كوفيد 19 اجى تيسرع هذا الموضوع يعني اجى حتى يهين ويهين تقبل ويجبر التكنولوجي بروفايدر يسرع بالديفلوبمنت تبع هذه الامور جبر المستهلك يتقبل تكنولوجي وجبر البزنس تو ادابت هذه التكنولوجي يعني من كل الميلات بتصور صارت هذه الادابتابيلتي مفروضه <تصفيق> حتى لو حتى لو لازم يبقى فيها استثمار جامد حاليا وهم مسكرين زي ما انت بتقول وما فيش يعني هل متقبلين الفكره ولا خلاص ما بقتش اختيار ده اللي انت عايز تقوله لا ما هي 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 مش من نهار للتاني من نهار للتاني حتصير <تصفيق> يعني هلا ان شاء الله الامور ترجع على بترجع بتفتح وبيرجع الامور بترجع على 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 حالها بس هيدا الشيء اللي صار حيخلي العالم يفكروا انه بركي رجع صار مره ثانيه هذا الشيء سو so, خلص العالم كلها حترجع تتهيا او تتحضر يعني حتى بحال صار صار ما صار و- ومثل ما شفنا صار في عالم فضلوا هيدي الطريقه يعني في عالم فضلوا يعملوا الصف من البيت فبحس هذا الشيء خلص دخل على حياتنا هذا ال- 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 هذا الديجيتال ترانسفورميشن حصلت وحصلت قديش هلا ان واي في ماركت إذا إذا البزنس أونر بينتبه إنه الماركت موجود رح يعمل الديفلوبمنت لازم ليحافظ على الماركت بعدين ما تنسي جيوغرافيكلي أنا بعتقد هيدا اللي يمكن بعد مش واعيين له كل البزنسز هو إنه في جيم بمصر يكون عم بيجيب كلاينتس ببيروت وقت القبل ما كان في مجال أبدا يقدر جيم بمصر يكبر الكلاينت بيس تبعيته يمكن كانت الكاباسيتي تبعيته 50 شخص ماكسيموم هلا اف بيعملوا ذا رايت انفستمنت تو جو ديجيتال فيهم يشتغلوا بكل نورث افريكا وبالميدل ايست اند دوبليكيت ذا سيرفيس فور ان انفستمنت من ناحيه مضطرين لانه عم ينحكى انه اتس نوت ذا اونلي بانديميك ويل بي فيسينج من ناحيه ثانيه اكتشف انه الماركت موجود وبيكبروا عندك مثلا ماركت مثل السعوديه اللي هو يمكن في اكسس لازم يتفكر ببرودكت ادابتبل اكثر فور ومن فور اونلاين للي عندهم مشكله سكيورتي وبرايفسي ات ويل بي ايفن مور انتريستينج تو اوبن تو ساتش ماركتس على البلاتفورم اونلاين وقت قبل ما كان هالشيء ممكن صح لا انا شخصيا بقول بالعكس اي شود جو فور ات شريف انت رايك كده كمان؟ أو أنا شايف إن كان في الأول الديجيتاليزيشن كان اختياري أو كان بيبقى في فيوتشر بلانز لي أو ماشين ستيبس سبوري بس لما حصلت البانداميك لا بقى خلاص كله بقى بيرش وكله زي تيستد يعني خلاص لقوا إن هو ده الفيوتشر صار خلاص أنا شايف حاليا إن في مصر حتى الإقبال على الكورسز بتاعت الديجيتاليزيشن وازاي تعمل تبقى انت ماركتير خلال الديجيتال بلاتفورم وكده كتير جدا يعني بقى مش قادر اقول لك عليه فلا ده حاليا ما بقاش اوبشن وما بقاش فيوتشر بلانز فكل دلوقتي بقى بيجهز عشان 
وهو ده الفيوتشر جميل وانا احب اشكركم جدا واحنا قعدنا النهارده كتير قوي مع بعض ومرسي جدا يا شريف على ان انت اتكلمت عن مصر وعلى المشاكل لكن برضو على الفرص اللي موجوده حاليا يعني الدنيا برضو صوره مش سودا سواء في كندا ولا في لبنان ولا في مصر صحيح في باب قفل لكن باب تاني فتح والباب اللي اتفتح ده اظن كمان مش هتبقى يعني فهي دي هن وقاعدين هن وقاعدين بساوس افريكا لا لا هن وقاعدين بالساوث افريكا they organized the tour de france with france so شفتي؟ انه كيف كان معقول حدا يتخيل هيك شيء؟ so لا definitely حكينا عن ايام عن سوري حكينا عن كم شغله باول بارت انه يمكن في داون سايد من ناحيه الفان اكسبيرينس انه الفانز بطلوا يلحقوا كل ال الايفنت او الاكتيفيتي اللي عم بتصير وبياخذوا شقف صغير لانه الانفورميشن صارت اونلاين بس مم. نفس الوقت الحسنات انه اكثر بكثير سو اتس اول اباوت ادابتنج لايك ذا هيومن ريس هاز بين فور مليونز اوف ييرز كمل كنت عايز اقول حاجه؟ لا بتصور شيء قالتها ايوه ايوه مثل ايوه ايوه I thought I was. I thought we were closing. Sorry, Kamel. ما أنا كان عندي بس سؤال شريف قبل لما كنت سألتك بس أنا بخصوص إنه التكنولوجيز اللي أدوبتت بين ال ال الكوتشية بمصر يعني اليوم إذا بتطلع على أنا في آل وبأميركا بالأن بي إي بتلاقي معهم سمارت تابلت على إيديهم عندهم عم بيطلع لهم فيدباك من الأرض هيت كيف اللي إحنا عم بتوزعه وين كيف استراتيجية تبعيتهم إذا عم تتطبق مضبوط ولا لا وبتعطيه فكره فيدباك للكوتش مشان يقدر ياخذ سمارت ديسيجن ميكنج بساعة الساعه يعني هو القصص قديش بعاد برايك تيبلشوا يوصلوا على مصر ومن مصر على الميدل ايست يعني من بعدها هو انا عايز اقول لك من من تقريبا ست سنين في كان انا كنت بشتغل كوتش في جولد جيم جولد جيم كان هو يعني نمبر 1 في مصر يعني فكان في جيمز بتنافس جولد جيم ابتدى يجيب اكويبمنتس جديده فيها بروجرامز فانت بتروح تحط اليوزر نيم بتاعك والباسورد ويطلع لك البروجرام بتاعك اللي معمول طول الاسبوع بيبقى الترينرز اللي عملوه لك الفكره دي كانت جديده وكان ابتدى يبقى في يعني ناس كتير تروح تشترك هناك عجباهم الفكره حاجه جديده خلاص انا مش محتاج ترينر ومش هدفع فيس زياده يعني بس مع الوقت ابتدت ان هي مش ناجحه لان آه انت محتاج الموتيفيتور محتاج حد يبقى واقف معاك بيشجعك بيدعمك انت يو فيلينج داون توداي فمش رايح الجيم فتلاقي حد بيكلمك لا يلا تعالى كده يعني فبس هي دي النقطه الوحيده اللي بقول لك عليها اللي هي الموتيفيشن يبقى في حد يبقى موجود معاك بيشجعك انما البروجرامز ما مشكله خالص اسمه بيرسونال ترينر يعني بصير كثير بيرسونال علاقه بينك وبينه بالظبط بصير تحكيمك النفساني يعني بتشيل همومك وتخبره مشاكلك بصير بيساعدك انا عايز اقول لحضرتك في ناس كثير كانوا بيتمرنوا معايا بس خلاص بقى هم يعني بقوا ساكنين في مدن ثانيه اماكن بعيده حتى الان بيقعدوا يتصلوا بيا مش عارفين نتمرن مع حد ثاني احنا سيستم خلاص تعودت عليه يلا اونلاين كلاس <تصفيق> جميل ميرسي جدا جدا آه انا بجد يعني سعيده جدا يا ايفا ان احنا عملنا الايفنت ده مع الاكسبرتس الهايلين دول ورشا طبعا الف الف شكر ليكي انت بقيت يعني جزء من التيم بتاعنا مش ممكن ابدا ان احنا نعمل اي ايفنت من غير رشا ومن غير الساين لانجويج انتربريتيشنز ميرسي جدا جدا ويا ريت نفضل على اتصال ونكمل في الموضوع ده لان اظن ان احنا محتاجين تو ريز اويرنس اكتر عن الموضوع ده في بلاد ثانيه كتير مش بس مصر ولبنان ميرسي يا ايفا ميرسي يا شيخ خلينا نقول للكل بس انه للي ما لحقوا السيشن من اولها فين يروحوا على البيج تبع ديجيتال ارابيا نتورك على فيسبوك and they watch the live stream it's already available it's still running and they can rewatch اذا ما حضروا اول قسم وهنحط كمان جزء اجزاء مهمه على اليوتيوب ولو حد عايز يتواصل معانا بليز انفو ات ديجيتال ارابيا دوت نتورك ونحب ان احنا ان شاء الله نشوفكم في الايفنتس بتاعتنا الجاي تصبح على خير ثانك يو افري باي باي ثانك يو ايفا فور ايفري ثينك ثانك يو ويلكم ثانك يو كامل